Hey, welcome back to another video. And today my goal is to destroy some LARPer dreams. I see all these gun channels popping up, pushing this agenda about being equipped for shit hits the fan. And all these dudes are running around in chess rigs, AR-15s, NVGs and whatnot. And like, there's this whole genre of men in the world that fantasize about what they missed out on in the military. So now they train military tactics under the guise and call it prepping. It's not prepping, it's LARPing. And, and I get it, we all need excuses to tell our wives why we need that new $3,000 sniper rifle. And hey, there's nothing wrong with LARPing. I love training overt tactical stuff too. I'm guilty as fuck of buying this stuff, being a combat vet myself. I mean, just look behind me. You know, it's all part of the full spectrum warrior mindset. You know, we even have some plans of launching some new tactical courses uh, in either 2024 or 2025. But today I want to talk about my experience in real disaster zones inside the U.S. as well as in the Caribbean. And also discuss my real life experience of being deployed to a disaster with guys that all had this military equipment with them and how that equipment was a liability and not an asset. <clears throat> First part of the video, we're gonna cover philosophy, a bit of history, and the end is where we'll dig into kind of the exact gear you should probably use. This video also isn't really geared towards rural homesteads and, and off-grid types. You can really kind of carry whatever you want in the middle of nowhere, but most of us live uh, in or near cities, so this discussion is geared towards urban dwellers. And hey man, if you think I'm wrong, please jump down in the comments and tell me why, and let us know what your perfect shit hits the fan gun is. The first thing we need to address is what are the primary uses for weapon systems in the U.S. during a, a shit hits the fan type disaster? And your two primary reasons for carrying a gun is for self-defense and the others for food procurement. I think people have this fantasy that if things get really bad that it's going to be urban warfare in the streets and you know maybe at some point in the dystopian future that might happen but it's been my experience across numerous disaster that the opposite happens. Oftentimes people you know prepare based on their perceived fantasies of what they think will happen and not what actually happens statistically or in a historical sense. It's always been my experience that when bad stuff happens, good people tend to band together to address the problem in groups. You know, people revert right back to tribal mentality and they get out and help each other, mostly because there's mu mutual benefit in doing so. And the human mind is optimized for tasks that are mutually beneficial. And in the U.S. where you have the largest armed population in the world, I think in a bad disaster you may initially see some major crime, but with a well-armed and trained populace, you're going to find very quickly that the armed citizens aren't going to tolerate much outright violence. Good people will pick up guns and kill bad guys. It's the American pastime to shoot people in the face that we think are bad. Hell, we've been traveling around the world to serve justice to people we think are bad for the last hundred years. You know, it's kind of our thing. Uh, we do, however, have one historical example of crazy violence during a disaster in the U.S., and that's during Hurricane Katrina. The number of murders and rapes during this event was pretty horrific. I had a lot of friends that served during that event and the tales they tell me are pretty bad. You had two primary problems. You had a, a large criminal element within the city and you had a civilian populace that was disarmed. You also had an extremely overzealous government security forces. But the key thing here is that when the government showed up, they showed up and started disarming the entire populace. They literally sent National Guard units door to door to seize legally owned weapons. They set up checkpoints for people escaping and searched their vehicles and boats and illegally took their weapons. Most people never got their guns back. That's why this idea that you're gonna run around overtly in a disaster with full battle rattle is really misguided in my opinion. You're gonna need weapons that can be hidden or relatively cheap and hopefully you can afford abundance of some if they're ever stolen or seized. Now, let's take a look at some old clips from Hurricane Katrina to see examples of why overt carry will likely be impossible and why you should seek to blend in and be able to hide your weaponry. Oh, 
Please open the door. They had AR-15s or M-16s. They were pointing at us. They told us, put your hands up in the air. Let us see your hands. They're drawing down on me? And they let the looters run rampant for over a week? Are you kidding me? I really thought they were going to kill me. I really did. They didn't care what your rights were. They were going to deny them. You're letting the thugs get away with everything and you're coming to honest, good citizens and taking away their protection, and it is wrong, wrong, wrong. But still, the order had been given for police and National Guard to go house to house, often with guns drawn, to evacuate residents and confiscate their firearms. No one will be able to be armed. We will take all weapons. It was a human drama with emotions and tensions running high. Patty Connie is still trying to recover physically and emotionally. They really did a number on me. From the day police forced her from her home. It was traumatic. All of a sudden, they were banging on the front door, the side door, and the, the back door, and they said, let us in. They kept pushing me back, pushing me back, and ended up like this. Then, Patty showed them a small revolver she was carefully holding in the palm of her hand. A camera crew was there to capture what unfolded next. I said, it's not even loaded, and I dropped it on the floor. You got a gun. Well, they punched me in the face. Look at my black and blue marks. Look at, look at what they did to me. They dragged me out of here. How could this happen in, in America? You're treated like a criminal, and you, you did nothing wrong. So your rights are really out the window. Richard Styron was in his friend's bass boat trying to salvage his gun collection before the looters stole it when they got stopped by a St. Tammany Parish Sheriff's boat. And we've had uh, policemen tell us that that's what they wanted us to do, but not the sheriff in St. Tammany. They just wanted to confiscate it from us. We felt like criminals at the time when they come up to us with M16s or AR15s, whatever it was, but there were four of them with rifles and holding on us. He said, be thankful we're taking your guns here. Why should I be thankful? Well, if they catch you with them on land, they're going to take you straight to jail. I thought, felt like it was un-American and then we had been violated. They took something from you. They stole something from you. That's the only way to put it. They took something that they didn't have a right to take. And the more I think about it, the madder I get. Jim Richard's home was badly damaged by Katrina, but when he tried to save his gun collection, had most of them stored up top. It too was confiscated by law enforcement. You know, they had no jurisdiction here. Uh, you know, I'm a law-abiding citizen, protecting myself, you know, and property. You know, they had no right to take. Buell Teal, a commercial crabber, was asked by emergency personnel to help find a safe water route for a barge carrying supplies to get into New Orleans. Then suddenly, a sheriff's boat with five officers on board, armed with automatic rifles, sped towards them. They didn't just have them pointed from their hip, they had them up at their shoulder and asked if we had any weapons on board. I told them, yes, we had two weapons. They said, get at the back of the boat with your hands in the air. We're coming aboard to search. Search and then seize Buell's firearms. And when Buell asked for a receipt, the officers flatly refused. As you can see, you know, during particular types of disaster, crime can get rampant, but typically only when the populace is disarmed and bad guys are heavily armed. And in really bad scenarios, the government will absolutely disarm you. You can 100% count on the military and police establishing some type of martial law, and they will not tolerate people overtly walking around armed. So this idea that you're going to be carrying AR-15s in an overt manner is total fantasy. If you take into account all the police and government agencies with arms, it's literally one of the largest and most well-equipped armies in the world. I mean, hell, even IRS agents have guns now. So it's not very likely that you're gonna need plate carriers, overt assault kits, NVGs, or much of anything that uh, would be considered a typical military loadout. Military and police will absolutely set up checkpoints and those checkpoints could definitely search you and confiscate your kit. I mean, 
Can you imagine how bad it would suck to have 20K worth of kit just taken by some dude with a gun and a badge under emergency orders? And you know, YouTube is full of all these guys with $50,000 worth of so-called prepper gear, pushing the newest tricked out military sniper rifle for SHTF. And I'm not knocking the idea of owning these weapons. I mean, hell, just look behind me. I, I obviously agree with being well-armed and uh, well-trained in overt and covert tactics, but let's just inject some reality into our training and preparedness. You're, you're not gonna be kicking indoors with NVGs and overt tactical gear. Your primary job in shit hits the fan is to avoid conflict and survive, feed yourself. You know, because there's, there's no helo coming to rescue you if you get shot. You get wounded, then you're likely just dead. End of story either directly from the wound or from infections later. So now let me dig into my experience operating with people who were armed to the teeth with this kind of equipment and this kind of disaster and how that became a liability and not an asset. In 2017, when Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico, I decided to self-deploy to this disaster to help with the recovery. As I'd been to many natural disasters previously in the U.S. and I figured I could be of service to people. For years I actually worked in construction following major storms around the U.S. and, and helping people rebuild their homes after losing everything. So I, I thought I had a good idea of what a disaster looked like. But man, when I arrived in Puerto Rico, it was like nothing I'd ever seen. It was like a nuclear bomb had gone off on that island. I don't have a ton of personal video of the destruction really, just of us helping out and delivering supplies, but it was absolutely wild how much destruction there was. You know, all roads were blocked, all electric on the whole island was, you know, of course gone. There was no communications except radio. It was a real disaster and being on an island made it even worse. Because you couldn't get supplies from anywhere except seafaring ship deliveries and plane flights coming in. So a disaster on an island is 10 times worse than those on the mainland for obvious reasons. And about a week after arriving, I embedded with a group of combat vets that had assumed control of a local airport and set up shop there. Uh, all great people, all had high levels of experience in combat and, and all ready to do the right thing. But here's the kicker. They were all armed to the teeth with overt combat gear. I won't get into how they got the gear on the island, but in a disaster, a lot of things can go under the radar. I was never personally armed at any point, never actually felt the need for it other than carrying blades and legal items that could be carried with no suspicion. Uh, the disaster was, was a lot safer than, than people might imagine uh, as far as crime and things of that nature. But they had full-blown overt combat gear to include ARs, NVGs, body armor, and all the things you'd see on a military infantryman. What we quickly learned was that all that gear became a liability. It wasn't allowed to be carried overtly and often scared the local people. Initially, cops were okay with the group being armed because the cops were the ones that gave us control of the airport so that we could usher in supplies from different government agencies. And we were great friends with the chief of, of police, so he was well aware of the equipment. But after a short period of time, being armed became an issue. And now having those firearms became a liability. And they had to find a place to stash them, and then they had to keep someone to guard them full time because there was literally 100K in gear laying around that could be stolen if locals became aware of it. Guys in the group still carried pistols and easily concealable gear, but all the large rifles and overt gear had to be hidden. What we needed most was water procurement tools, medical, uh, radios, generators, cash, and basic equipment needed to rebuild a destroyed island. I mean, sourcing gas and chainsaws was way more important than security issues. Uh, cash was actually the most underrated prep I'd never thought of until seeing that disaster. It became scarce real quick, and you couldn't get anything without it. You know, which is another reason we should be totally against a cashless society. And in most major disasters, you literally never see people overtly armed. And if they are, they tend to be disarmed by military or police. And then they just never see their expensive equipment again. So if that's the case, how can we legally defend ourselves? And you know, what equipment would be useful for a major disaster or SHTF? So let's kind of just dig into what I recommend. Okay, so let's dig into the fun stuff. You know, what guns should you carry? And this video isn't designed to be like one of the top five shit hits the fan guns where, you know, a guy comes on and shows you, you know, five different models of an AR-15 and, and different links. Uh, I'm not of that mindset. You should carry what you practice with and what you're used to. Uh, you should probably have something that's affordable and you can have more than one of so that it, you know, if it gets seized, confiscated, you know, you've got backups. Um, but your number one issue has got to be concealability. You've got to be able to throw this thing in a backpack and be able to hide it. 
You know, your rifle is not going to be your main go-to self-defense implement uh, immediately. It's something that's going to be carried in a backpack and your primary go-to is going to be a pistol. Uh, you know, I'm not going to tell you what pistol to carry. Uh, I personally carry a Staccato C2. I think it's probably the best, you know, pistol out there. I can carry it in a drop leg, overt manner for full-blown, uh, you know, overt tactical training. And then it's my concealed carry gun that I carry, the, you know, all the time around the city with me. So in overt tactical training, I'm carrying the exact same gun that I'm carrying every single day around the city. So carry what you're used to. Uh, should probably be nine mil. Nine mil is the, the most abundant, you know, widely accepted round out there. Um, you know, and you'll, you'll need several holsters, you know, whether you decide to carry outside the waistband or inside the waistband, uh, it's really up to, you know, how you plan on dressing. It just needs to not be seen. Uh, the next thing is, is with rifles, we need to be concealed. I, I'm just going to keep hammering this. Like you, your rifle needs to be a backpack gun. It needs to be something that you can throw in some kind of, uh, you know, medium sized backpack. that's not going to draw too much attention. Something that's not going to look too tactical, you know, all mollied out. You need to blend in. You need to be the gray man. Now I'm of the mindset, you know, at least for, you know, shit hits the fan that, AK is, is going to be better than AR, um, but that being said, you should carry, if you're in a group, you should carry what your friends are carrying, what your family's carrying, what everyone else is equipped with, because if they've got the same ammo and equipment, you've got, you know, you, you can share. Um, <clears throat> now, I think as far as SBRs are concerned, short build rifles, the AK just kind of does it better. Um, you know, there's going to be a lot of people that argue with me out there, but you know, these, these short barreled AKs have been around forever. They work great. They're dependable. You, you know, they're modernized now with Picatinny. You can throw dot sights on them. I mean, you can put, you know, LPVOs, you can put whatever you want on them. Um, and you don't have to do any special modifications or buy something like a Sig Sauer MCX that's, you know, almost 3000 bucks, uh, to get a folding stock. It's much harder to get, uh, a decently priced AR that has a folding stock and is going to easily fit in a backpack. Now they make adapters, they make all kinds of stuff out there, uh, you know, that will get the job done. But I mean, for 800 bucks, you can go to your local pawn shop, pick up one of these AK pistols, uh, and it's ready to rock and roll right out the box. Um, you know, with no real modifications to it. All you got to do is throw on your accessories. You know, so as far as a disaster where you'd like to have multiple of these maybe stashed in different locations, uh, it's just kind of a, a better setup in my opinion. Um, I love ARs, you know, I've got ARs right behind me. They serve a great purpose. They're probably a better rifle as far as, as combat is concerned, but uh, the AK is, is more my go-to. So as far as your rifles, just keep in mind that SBRs are the way to go. Now we're currently under this pistol based brand ban um, that they're fighting in court. So this is a pistol at the moment. Uh, if they remove the ban, I'll put, you know, a brace back on. And if, if they don't and they keep it in order, uh, you know, I'll, I'll register this thing as an SBR. Uh, but things are just kind of up in the air at the moment. Now, most of us aren't going to be going solo. You know, most of us have family, friends, we're going to operate in a group. So a lot of your gun considerations should be geared around uh, who has what, um, and you should all be of kind of like mind. You know, if you're going to be all AK or all AR, whatever you decide on that uh, is, is good to go. Um, as far as your pistols are concerned, like I said, 9 mil is the way to go, but when traveling in groups, uh, you're going to possibly have women and kids. And it's, you don't need everybody with a 9 mil, right? It'd be great to have some people with some 22s, even with the rifles. I mean, you know, like a Ruger 1022, I can throw a folding stock on this. I've got a folding stock for Ruger 1022, and it goes in a backpack as well. You know, so like we talked about before, the two primary uses for, you know, these types of weapons are for you know, self-defense and food procurement. And honestly, you're probably more likely to use it for food procurement than you are for uh, defending yourself. You know, so having a 22 in the group is a great idea, uh, whether that be like a, a Ruger Buck 22 pistol or a full-blown, uh, you know, backpack style 22 rifle, uh, you know, just 
those are some considerations for you. Uh, women and kids can carry those kind of things, and they also work in a self-defense role. You'd be highly surprised at how effective and accurate a 1022 is out to a couple hundred yards. Um, so it's, a, it's just fine for self-defense as well. Not optimal, but can be done. Now let me just kind of quickly talk about some backpacks, you know, because in any kind of bug out situation, you're going to have to carry, you know, your house on your back. And you're also going to have to carry your weapon system and your ammo. And so there's kind of two mindsets of this. If you live in a rural area and you're, you're, you're needing to, you know, do some kind of recon or whatever, it doesn't really matter if you look tactical. You know, something like this, this is a Mystery Ranch uh, overload bag, I believe, and I've had it for years. Uh, and it's got a compartment back here. This basically will essentially separate and you can store a weapon system uh, in between the frame and the actual bag. This, can actually carry almost anything from jerry cans to, um, you know, boxes, bags, whatever. Uh, it's got a separatable frame that allows you to put almost anything in there. Uh, and for a weapon system that's fairly compact, uh, it's, it's concealable. If we're in an urban area, it really doesn't matter what bag you choose. Um, you know, these are some Fjall Raven bags. I have several of these back from when we used to sell survival gear. It's a very kind of you know, hiker looking backpack, something that would blend in, but really it just needs to be large enough to fit your, your weapon system. You know, if you look at the scale of it, right, I can easily throw all of my sustainment gear, my shelter water, fire, food procurement tools, that kind of thing in there, as well as my gun. And if we got into a self-defense situation, you know, your first go-to is going to be your pistol, right? It's any kind of hasty ambush where you've been thrown into a situation where you're taking fire, your number one goal is one, going to be to get to cover, right? Just run immediately or pull, return fire, get to cover, right? Because you can't afford to get shot in a shit hits the fan type situation. There's not a helo, this is in the army. You know, there's, there's, there's no QRF team coming to get you, right? So we've got to be able to put down some return fire, head to cover, and then grab our rifle out of our bag, lay down more cover fire, and then hopefully if we can, we can escape from that situation entirely. Your job, you know, as a civilian in a bad situation is to survive by any means necessary. And that doesn't include getting in long, drawn-out gunfights with, you know, bad people you don't know. Um, so... When choosing gear, urban situations, you got to blend in. Backpacker, hiker looking stuff, nothing that looks uh, or, uh, overt, it's got to look covert, you got to blend in. And the way that you dress uh, should allow you to blend in so that you don't get, um, you know, you're not just some obvious mark, uh, you know, that, that looks like, you know, either want to be robbed or, um, you know, interrogated by police and military and they want to go through your stuff. So gray man philosophy with everything, concealability is number one. Uh, in your group, make sure that you have a well-rounded set of tools from your self-defense rifles to your pistols. And then for the women and the kids, or if you're solo, you know, you're going to have your rifle and then a pistol is, is it, like 22. That way you can take small game with it um, and it's got dual purpose, right? So these are some things to think about. I don't want to ramble too much on about gear, but um, I'm going to cover one more thing, and that's like some basic chest rigs and things of that nature. So we'll dive into that next. Okay, so the last and final thing I want to cover is just having some kind of combat loadout with you, right? So I'm not against having, you know, a tactical loadout but it needs to be concealable, right? You need to be able to throw a jacket or a hoodie. It needs to be, if you, if you need to carry plates or some kind of plate carrier type system, it needs to be a slick system, maybe two or three mags, tourniquet, pistol mags, and it needs to be concealable under a hoodie to where nobody would know that you have it. Uh, a really great company that I recently ran into uh, called Unobtainium Gear uh, has a uh, covert a uh, chest rig setup that's really modular and uh, I just thought it was really cool and uh, it's a good, good kit to have so if you're looking for something along those lines to where you can um, you know have a full loadout but then just have literally a Hawaiian shirt or you know collared shirt or something over the top of it and nobody knows I think that's kind of the go-to brand. 
but that's a wrap. I, I just wanted to you know, get some information out there about my experience and what I've seen and what I think you would really need if there was a major worldwide disaster you know, and it came down to surviving. Uh, but, you know, if you guys want to get some survival training, make sure to check out survivalschool.us. Come out and see us, get some dirt time. And uh, we do have some tactical courses planned for 2024, 2025. Uh, we're lining those out now. So thanks and have a great day. Sigma 3 out.